Madison. I think today um, I can give you more on Wright. Um, Fife will reappear then toward the end of today's session, and much of, most of next week's session will particularly be given to Fife and eventually getting around to campus. Many of you will know this uh, extraordinary building, this extraordinary house here in Grand Rapids well. For about a year now, I've been a docent at uh, the Meyer and Sophie May House here in Grand Rapids. It is really an extraordinary building, and I, I can't tell you how much fun it is once a month to tell other people what an extraordinary house it is. And one of the things that makes being a docent there really fun is the fact that at the end of a tour, inevitably, people who have a lot of experience with Wright Houses will say something like, this is really spectacular. And for people who you know, have, have visited the iconic locations, uh, for them to be wowed by this house is, is really satisfying. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm never surprised when they are wowed by it because it is an extraordinary house. It's an extraordinary house in terms of its history, to be sure. But I think what really makes it special is the, the, the way in which, uh, from mid-1980s forward, it has just been so lovingly restored, cared for. And I also would stress that it also is very much a living piece of architecture. Um, so one of the challenges of historic preservation is you can generate a lot of interest, uh, say, you know, we're going to fix this up and we're going to fix the roof and we're going to put things back. And everybody can get really excited about that. The problem is, yeah, but then what is it? What, what, what do you do with it? And once, you know, sort of the community has visited it once, no one really wants to go back. And 10 years later, it needs more repair. And now no one's as excited about uh, fundraising for it. And the degree to which Steelcase has really avoided that scenario by living into this house, using it for corporate events, uh, opening it up to the public, um, it, it's, it's sort of, there's a way in which it still has this sort of organic uh, life. And I, I stress that because one of the themes that I want to underscore is that buildings are not static, buildings do not stay the same. And I think Wright, as well as anyone, certainly Fife understood, that part of organic architecture is recognizing that buildings have to adapt, they have to change. And sometimes that means actually they look a lot like they did 100 years ago. Uh, but those of you who know, sorry, if the microphone is fading in and out. Is it all right? Can you hear me OK? Um, those of you um, who know this building well will know that that uh, restoration included the insertion of massive amounts of commercial grade construction materials. It's sort of strange to think you know, that a house about 100 years old would need that sort of support. Uh, but that also takes us to Frank Lloyd Wright. I will say, just as an aside, um, that Frank Lloyd Wright, I think often, there was often this sense of, you know, the jokes about Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, roofs, they always leak. Uh, the, the jokes about, you know, if, if you're judging a, a house by how well it keeps the water out, then Frank Lloyd Wright turns out to not have been a great architect. I, I, I think for Frank Lloyd Wright, Architecture is a kind of essay. It's a kind of experiment. And he really is interested in pushing materials uh, to their edge. And it's, it's not that I think he didn't care if the, if the roofs would leak, but I also think that wasn't the priority for him uh, that maybe it would have been for the homeowner, say. Um, in any event, right, what's, what's really exciting about this house is the degree to which this kind of attention, uh, absolutely financial resources uh, from Steelcase were applied to this house, and in all kinds of ways, Grand Rapids benefits from that today. 
Um, it, it's a nice reminder of the way in which Frank Lloyd Wright very much wanted to reinvent architecture. And in that incredibly prolific period of the first decade of the 20th century, um, in about nine years, Wright designs over 100 houses, close to 120 houses. So it is an incredibly productive period for Wright. It also is a period for Wright that's incredibly frustrating. And so by the end of that decade, Wright feels, I think professionally, um, at a, kind of his wit's end. Certainly, uh, personally, he feels uh, entirely stuck uh, and desperately wants out. I'll say more, I think, I'll say more about both of those aspects, both his professional course and his personal life um, in, in just a bit. But if you've not been to the May House recently, let me just put a plug in go back. Uh, it will be even better than you remember it. Uh, if by chance you've never been there, then by all means, uh, that's what you should do next, uh, get to the May House. One of the things that also makes it really fun to be a docent there is there is no prescribed script. Uh, so docents get a lot of training. Certainly there are kind of key points all docents are supposed to make, but it means that you're not getting a kind of canned, rehearsed uh, spiel each time you go to the May House. I, I note that because it means that if you go to the May House four different times next week, you will get slightly different experiences. Some docents will point things out that other docents won't, won't point out. Uh, you will see the house uh, in four different ways in four different visits. Um, so, you know, again, if you've been, go again. Uh, one of the things that has especially impressed me, if you're just sort of thinking, like, next time you go, what should I be looking for? Wright was so incredibly uh, gifted in terms of windows and light. So much of what really can be magical about Wright spaces is how he's able to uh, get incredible amounts of light even into, you know, West Michigan interiors. Uh, and it's easy for me to say this in the summer, but it's also true in the winter. And so the next time you're in the May House, pay attention to the quality of the light, lots of southern exposure. That's obviously very intentional on Wright's part. But it's not just the amount of light, it's the quality of light, the way in which the light comes in in very gentle ways there also is an incredible degree of shadow play that comes in through uh, those windows with the art glass. So next time you're in there, have pay particular attention to light. Um, of course, the things that we typically stress as we're thinking about prairie style architecture um, from the first decade of the 20th century are horizontals. The way in which Wright is asking us to come at a house not in terms of expecting uh, really emphatic expressions of vertical elements to determine our experience of the house. Uh, it's not the vertical that orders the space, but instead it is the horizontal that orders the space. Um, even the way in which he's taking very, you know, sort of uh, vertical elements like doors and chimneys and finding a way to incorporate them into walls, into the rest of the experience of the house. Uh, obviously, that image on the left, if you think about those limestone elements, those limestone caps that wind their way across uh, the house. Uh, so it's happening at the lower level, it's certainly happening at the mid-level, but it's happening really up here as well. Um, the way in which Wright is minimizing the roof element. So you, absolutely the May House has that beautiful, not particularly exceptional, but beautiful uh, terracotta tile on the roof. Uh, but you don't see a lot of it. You know it's up there, but you know the roof is not the element that he wants you to, to kind of focus on primarily. Um, the way in which he's creating space, almost conjuring space where it doesn't exist. You might think about uh, the way in which the bay of that main window projects out over the edge of the house. Uh, he's finding space on the second floor uh, by, you know, sort of claiming area from the roof. I think one of the common reactions when people visit the May House as well is it just feels so incredibly modern. It still feels relevant. Uh, and much of that, of course, has to do with the open plan. 
uh, you walk into that, you know, sort of wonderful foyer area that very fluidly flows into the living room and it all flows so easily out to the veranda. It easily flows around into the dining room and it feels very comfortable. That's very much how people want to live today. Of course, the very big difference uh, with the May House and what an open plan has come to mean today, uh, for us, the open plan tends to locate the kitchen uh, in some way very visible, in some way also part of that open experience. Uh, and that's not the experience of the May House. It still very much assumes, I think, a housekeeper. Uh, it assumes in certain ways a back of house experience uh, that was pretty bifurcated from the experience of sitting in the living room or sitting out on the veranda. The house makes, a, it, I think it was a, an incredibly modern house in that it doesn't take a lot uh, of work to, to keep that house running, but the quality of life goes up dramatically with a housekeeper. And so there is still a way in which there's something very traditional, uh, perhaps, about the way in which life would have, would have worked at the May House. One of the questions that often comes up with the May House is uh, regarding garages, uh, because Wright had this you know, sort of love affair with cars, to be sure, but also a kind of complicated relationship with garages. Um, and in fact, the May House does not have a garage and, and didn't. Uh, Mr. May did have a car and it went home with the chauffeur, with the driver each evening. Um, so again, like that's not how I get to work every day, right? Um, so in some ways, the May House can feel very modern. In other ways, I think it, it does sort of suggest a different era. The exhibition, um, and I would remind you there is an exhibition um, associated with um, this series of, of courses, or this course, this, this series of lectures. Um, the exhibition opens with um, a version of this desk. And I mention, I, I include the desk here. I'll say more about what it's doing in the context of the exhibition in just a, a moment. But I show you the desk just again to make uh, the point about cords, about these strands that come together, about the way in which this history really ends up being multiple histories. So, you know, why is Steelcase interested in restoring, um, it's, you know, spending a lot of money, clearly, it's never been, you know, sort of disclosed how much money the restoration cost, but clearly Steelcase is invested in the May House. So, you know, what's going on with that? Well, certainly Steelcase has a very long relationship with Frank Lloyd Wright going back to the 1930s. And so it was Steelcase, I guess then Metal Office Company, something like that. Um, so Steel, the company that, that we now know as Steelcase uh, produced the furniture for this extraordinary office building uh, in Racine, the SC Johnson building. And the desk is, is really extraordinary. At the same time, it is really useful for you to imagine the space where the desk was supposed to go. So it's not just that Wright's in imagining this as a single kind of desk that will kind of stand alone. He's really kind of grappling with like what is a modern, you know, corporate headquarters supposed to look like. And he's really trying to think about that interior experience in sculptural terms. Right, so he's got this incredible, I mean, technically it turns out to have been really complicated. Again, he's pushing materials to their kind of almost breaking point. And in fact, um, the, the people who have to approve the building are very skeptical that the support system will even work. You'll note the way in which these, uh, su these vertical supports taper down. Um, and there's a kind of lightness to them to be sure. Maybe the black and white image actually gives you a little clearer sense of that. Well, in true, you know, true uh, Frank Lloyd Wright fashion, uh, when he's challenged, uh, he you know, sort of turns that into this huge spectacle and does this test. And he you know, has huge amounts of weights uh, placed before the building is constructed on just one of these supporting elements. Uh, and I forget how much weight it ends up holding, but it ends up being you know, far beyond what actually was required for each, each one. And so you know, sort of everybody's convinced, okay, this will work. Um, but it, 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 it speaks to the degree to which Wright is thinking about you know, not what should uh, an office building look like in terms of people's regular conventions of what an office building is, but how am I going to reinvent that experience? And once you've got this huge open area, now you've obviously got a lot of office furniture that's going to fill it. How does the office furniture do something just as architecturally 
uh, significant as what the rest of the building is doing. Uh, and so it becomes, this becomes, uh, the desk becomes the solution. Uh, again, you can think about the way in which Wright is carefully attending to both vertical and horizontal elements, but it's the horizontal elements that he seems really most interested in. How does he give us these incredibly rounded forms? How is he layering this element with this element with this element? Um, and even the vertical uprights of the legs are realized um, as horizontal elements. So they also just become sort of sides that reinforce the overall horizontality, the kind of organic feel of what a desk might be. All right, so uh, the desk that is in the exhibition is not one of the original desk uh, produced by the forerunner of Steelcase, Steelcase in uh, the 1930s. Uh, very few of those, um, if you want to purchase one of those, those come up for auction very rarely. Um, and as you can imagine, they're incredibly expensive. That is not what we have in the gallery. Uh, instead, what we have in the gallery is a reproduction. It was authorized um, by the, the Wright Foundation and Steelcase. Um, it was produced in the 1990s as a kind of authorized copy. Okay, um, not actually inexpensive in the 1990s, not inexpensive now, but also not hugely expensive by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so not particularly important necessarily as an object, uh, but in terms of the provenance of our desk, the desk that's now in the gallery and now part of Calvin's uh, Center Art Gallery collection, the provenance, the history of ownership of that desk is absolutely special, spectacular, as good as provenance gets. Um, so, as you can see here, uh, it was a donation from John Hunting. It was John Hunting's father, David Hunting, who negotiated the original contract with Frank Lloyd Wright. So as negotiations were first getting underway, um, Steelcase is like, yeah, we can build these things. And it is David Hunting then who goes to Spring Green um, in 1936 to meet with Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, and just in terms of timing, if you think back to what we did last week, I was spending a lot of time talking about you know, the 1930s and Depression era and the world in which Tally, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is launching Taliesin. Uh, that's just two years after Fife left Taliesin. So there's something sort of wonderful about the way in which you, know, you get these sort of overlaps or almost overlaps in history. Um, I'm particularly intrigued by this provenance because I just think there's something really incredibly endearing about the son, John Hunting. And by this point, he's fairly old. Um, so, th like the idea that John Hunting, you know, kind of late in his career, early retirement, is now thinking about his father, and he's thinking about the, the you know, what, what do I wish I had? I wish I had one of those desks, uh, right? And you know, he pays the $8,000 or whatever the, the, the desk cost uh, in the 1990s. I'm really intrigued by the way in which the next generation acquires the thing they wish the f that was in the family already. Right? And, and actually, collectors will do this over and over again, uh, including even the Royal Collection. Uh, royal collectors do this. Uh, so as you're going through the history of the Royal Collection, you often will kind of find works of art, and you think, oh, well, that must have been acquired by so-and-so when it was you know, made. And it turns out it was the son or the grandson wishing the father or the grandfather had acquired that thing. That's when you go acquire the thing. And so like the idea that it is... Uh, the son in the 1990s thinking back about his father's accomplishment, the thing his father's remembered for in the 1930s, I think there's just something incredibly uh, wonderful and endearing about that. In the context of the exhibition then, this introduces, as it were, the relationship between Fife and Frank Lloyd Wright. It kind of opens up the world of Taliesin uh, more generally. It also works really well because also in the mid-1990s, Clearly, Fife is also thinking about the 1930s. Uh, so th there's an issue of the Frank Lloyd Wright Quarterly uh, that includes Bill Fife on the cover. 
And then that gets uh, a fair amount of correspondence uh, from Fife with others reflecting on, you know, what was it like there, who else was on the cover, uh, all of those sorts of issues. So there's some way in which the 1990s is a period of reckoning for what was happening 60 years earlier. I note that here because I think we're in a similar uh, moment of reckoning now, 50 years after the transition to the Noel Crest campus was complete in 1973. Uh, a lot of this is stuff that people have known, uh, but there's also a way in which, at least you know, in terms of a lot of Calvin uh, current students, even administration, there's also this moment when a lot of that collective awareness, that sort of institutional memory, is in danger of just sort of being lost. And so if this project can in some way uh, sort of get down at least some of the crucial experiences, uh, connections, uh, facts, stories, narratives, then I, I think something useful has happened. Okay, let me uh, also, so we've I've talked about the May House, let me also talk briefly about the Roby House, um, a house that has in some ways a kind of parallel history as the May House. So the Roby House, uh, I mentioned it last week briefly, uh, it's in Hyde Park in Chicago. I was talking about the University of Chicago and the way in which that very traditional neo-Gothic campus being constructed in the 1890s and then the next two or three decades. And then, you know, frankly, right, the, absolutely adjacent to campus comes along and says, no, 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 I don't know what you're doing with that kind of neo-Gothic thing. Uh, this, is, this is what architecture should be. Um, if you're looking for some sort of residential context for it, the houses above are on the uh, 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 Kimbark, just around the corner, um, uh, maybe a, in some cases two or three blocks away. But those are very typical examples of Hyde Park houses uh, that would have existed prior to 1909, 1910. So very similar to the kind of residential context of Heritage Hill here in Grand Rapids. Uh, so it's not just that the May House is extraordinary, but it is so emphatically different from all of these other extraordinary houses. And then there's something, right, that sort of leads you wanting to understand more about how that neighborhood worked. Once again, you have strong horizontal elements. Um, as actually, as is the case with the May House, uh, there's an incredible amount of fussy brickwork going on. Um, so you'll, you'll recognize the kind of large horizontal elements, again, limestone caps and general shape of the house. But you'll also note, and, and it shows up even, even in the, the lower right image, but certainly in the, the lower left image, you, you'll note the way in which you see a kind of almost corduroy or ribbed effect that you're able to see the horizontal mortar joints uh, pretty distinctly that those read as horizontal. Okay, so how does Wright achieve that? He achieves it uh, in a way that must have you know, driven uh, the bricklayers absolutely bonkers. Um, so he's got two different colors of mortar. One matches the brick. And so the vertical mortar grout joints uh, are the brick color ones, and it is the horizontal that is the kind of gray-white. And you know, so you realize, oh, ac yeah, actually, you don't really see mortar, as it were, uh, vertically between. It's the horizontal mortar that you see. And it gets worse. Um, the horizontal joint is raked out. So he's giving you a bit of a kind of shadow effect with the horizontal. Uh, but the vertical joints are left flush with the brick. Again, you just think if, if you're the one uh, doing that brickwork, uh, you, you, know, you must have some choice words uh, for Frank Lloyd Wright as, as you're working. Uh, but, you know, it, it suggests the attention to detail. It suggests the kind of overall um, attention to not just big gestural ideas, but then how do I play out those big gestural ideas uh, even into very small levels of detail. You'll also note this incredibly uh, impressive, uh, really virtuosic uh, example of the cantilever roof. So, you know, this is exactly the kind of thing that, that you know, Wright thrives on. Uh, we, the surrounding houses don't do that. 
right, that if you extend a roof out like that, you're supposed to have vertical supporting elements. Uh, but Wright's, you know, he's figured it out, you don't need it, we can just have that uh, roof project out. Uh, it also turns out that it's kind of useful, often with a roof like that, uh, to have some way of removing the water, right? Um, and in fact, Wright is taking that into account. See it right there? You see it right there? So there is a gutter system, and there are downspouts. It's just the downspouts aren't actually the vertical downspouts that we're used to. They're just these open uh, forms. Uh, Wright referred to these as scuppers, um, and certainly this is one element that also shows up on the May House. It also showed up in various places around Calvin's campus. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a disaster in Michigan winters, and therefore most of the scuppers uh, here on Calvin's campus have been replaced. Uh, that said, uh, scuppers still exist on the chapel, and I love them. Anytime it's raining, uh, I love walking by the chapel, and I love seeing the, the water pour down. Um, Steelcase at the May House has devised a solution to the icicle problem. So if you, you know, insert a heated element, uh, then you're able to manage the kind of uh, thaw-freeze effect uh, that gives you the giant icicles. Um, I'm not quite... I, I, again, it sort of would have been nice if maybe Wright had, you know, developed that kind of uh, innovation. Um, but, but why does he not like gutters? He doesn't like gutters because he, it, they feel tacked on. They feel like some sort of accessory uh, that you don't need all the time. You only need it when it's raining. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, the vertical element of water falling. But why would I want this kind of clunky metal thing you know, on the side of a building that's just sort of, you know, tacked on. Uh, it's not integrated into the rest of the design. And Wright loves the idea that design is fully integrated. Um, and so, right, he just is sort of brave enough, bold enough, crazy enough to say, well, do we really need that? Uh, and, you know, actually maybe the answer is yes, uh, but Wright at least is willing to, to explore what happens when you just don't have it, when you come up with some other way um, to manage that issue, that problem. The, the Roby House actually is, is a pretty tall building. Um, I think there's sometimes a tendency to imagine that someone who loves horizontals and loves working with the land uh, must be, you know, sort of designing single-story buildings. Um, as you can tell, uh, I mean, it is a tall building, three stories. Um, so it's not that Wright necessarily wants only single-story buildings, but he's thinking about how do you manage that relationship differently. Uh, and so, notwithstanding that, notwithstanding the chimney that is there, uh, it is the horizontal elements. It is a sense of enclosure, privacy, protection uh, that Wright is most interested in. Okay, where, where is Wright actually working? I think lots of us have some familiarity with uh, Oak Park, the residents in Oak Park, and that uh, incredible studio space uh, at Oak Park. So if you've never visited Oak Park or if you've visited Oak Park but not visited uh, the, the right home and studio, then by all means do that. And that's, that studio in Oak Park is extraordinary. Lots of design work happened there to be sure. Wright also maintained an office in this building, the Steinway building, or Steinway Hall, uh, until 1908. And it turns out that Steinway Hall really is an amazing story about collaboration. Um, the, some of the most important um, innovative architects in Chicago around the turn of the century had offices uh, in the upper floor, maybe upper two floors of the Steinway building. You'll also note who designed um, Steinway Hall, Dwight Perkins. Uh, that's the father of Larry Perkins, of Perkins and Will. So the degree to which this history sort of folds in and out on top of each other, through each other, uh, repeatedly is pretty extraordinary. I'll come back to Steinway Hall uh, in, in just a, a moment. Uh, Marion Mayoni. Um, I tried to suggest last time that for all the, you know, sort of traditional rhetoric around Wright as genius, and certainly Wright encouraged uh, that rhetoric, there also is a way in which we could think about Frank Lloyd Wright as a brilliant collaborator. And Marion Mayoni is part of that story, uh, to be sure. 
Um, so Marion Maione um, is the second woman to receive an architectural degree from MIT in the 1890s. MIT, uh, arguably the most important architecture school uh, in the United States uh, at the, in the period. Um, she goes on, I think she's the first, maybe second, licensed woman to practice architecture in Illinois, one of the first women uh, in the United States generally. Uh, and by, the 18, uh, by 1897, she's working for Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, it is interesting. What does she immediately do after completing her degree at MIT? She goes on a kind of grand tour to Europe. Uh, and it turns out that's very common. Lots of MIT graduates, after finishing architecture, you know, they've studied all about these, you know, sort of great historical um, buildings. They go and see them firsthand. Uh, after about a, uh, a year uh, of, of that, she's back in Chicago, or she's back in the United States, she's in Chicago, uh, working at Steinway Hall because it turns out Dwight Perkins was her first cousin. Um, so she's related uh, to um, the Perkins. Uh, it makes sense that she shows up at Steinway Hall. I think it makes sense that Frank Lloyd Wright was impressed with her. Uh, and, you know, it's not long before uh, she's doing design work for Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, the, the photograph, so the photograph uh, on top uh, is Marion Mahoney. Um, the photograph on the left is uh, Kitty Wright. That's Kitty. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's wife, um, and then that's Marion uh, to the left. And that photograph, I don't know what to do with that photograph, but that photograph suggests to me that this is not just a kind of professional relationship, that somehow this is very, like these people are friends, they're eating dinner together, they're like, you know, in each other's lives. And so whatever we, you know, kind of make of this social milieu, um, I think this is not just sort of our world of, well, yeah, I hired a great draft, you know, drafter for the office and um, she's working on such and such. I think these are, uh, there's a kind of entangling of personal and professional relationships. Uh, many of you will also know this house in Grand Rapids, the Amberg House. Um, and it also is just absolutely spectacular. Uh, it continues to be a private residence, but every now and then on the um, Heritage Hill tours, uh, it is open. So, you know, next time uh, it's open, by all means, it is worth getting there early and standing in line and uh, visiting that house. Uh, for a long time, when I was first, you know, sort of trying to figure out Grand Rapids, this was explained to me as like an almost Frank Lloyd Wright house. And I think in all kinds of ways that is not fair to this house. Uh, so what's the story? Uh, the Ambergs, uh, they were the parents of Sophie May. So if you're thinking about the May house, it's Meyer and Sophie May. This house was commissioned originally from Frank Lloyd Wright by Sophie's parents. Um, and in all kinds of ways, Sophie, I think, is actually the, maybe, it's not that Meyer May is not interesting. I think Sophie May may be more interesting um, than Meyer was. Um, her grandfather, um, so Hattie Amberg's father um, was the first, uh, sorry, was, uh, uh, was mayor of Grand Rapids. Um, so if you, you know, sort of, I, I think I did kind of imagined um, that somehow Sophie may, you know, I don't, I don't know, that she was kind of an, an immigrant and kind of, you know, somehow existed sort of at the edges or the margins and, you know, sort of got lucky and ended up in the May House. She's born in Grand Rapids, absolutely part of the establishment. Uh, it is her grandfather who was the immigrant, so he immigrant, immigrates uh, from Germany uh, to the United States and just very, very quickly succeeds. So that side of the family is absolutely, you know, sort of successful by any stretch uh, of the imagination. And it also seems to me that if we're thinking about Sophie's parents also commissioning a house from Grand Rapids, or from Grand Rapids, from Frank Lloyd Wright here in Grand Rapids, it seems to me that that might suggest that Sophie maybe is as excited about ha living in a house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright as her husband, Meyer May, is. So I think in some ways we got to sort of activate Meyer and Sophie May 
um, together uh, in, in this you know, sort of love of architecture. In any event, this house was about six months behind um, the May house, and it turns out uh, that six months uh, was pretty significant for the biography of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and so uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, I, I mentioned this uh, earlier, Frank Lloyd Wright by uh, late 1909 has just had it. Um, he has fallen in love with Mae McChaney, one of his clients. Um, they've probably been having an affair for a, a few years by this point. Neither spouse will grant a divorce. Um, so, you know, they feel sort of stuck uh, personally. Um, they're, you know, sort of ostracized and, you know, lots of whispering and gossip and all the rest that's playing out in terms of Oak Park, where they, where they still live. Uh, and they they're all go to church together. They're all in the same social circles, uh, right? So it's this very kind of complicated, you know, sort of social experience, to be sure. Um, I think also, frankly, right by this point, by the end of this decade, is deeply concerned that the rest of his career is going to be designing expensive suburban houses. And he's clearly demonstrated that he can do that, and he's successful at that. But that's not all Frank Lloyd Wright wants out of architecture. And I think by 1909, he's not sure what he wants, but he's just sure he doesn't want to keep designing suburban houses. Uh, you know, the first 50 must have been exciting, the next 50 maybe less so. Uh, and I don't mean that he's not clearly still very good at it. The Roby House and the May House suggest that by the end of that decade, he has figured out how to do this. It's also clear that Frank Lloyd Wright no longer has his heart in doing that. So in September of 1909, September 22nd of 1909, Frank Lloyd Wright signs over his practice to von Holst. Uh, he knows that he has houses that aren't finished, um, and he also knows he has contracts that for which the designs are not even begun. And so he signs over his practice to Hermann von Holst. It turns out Hermann von Holst also uh, earned his architecture degree from MIT in uh, 1896, I think. Um, so, you know, he and Marion know each other, they get along. There actually was talk that Marion would take over the practice and she didn't want anything to do with it. Um, as it turns out, she ended up staying on and doing a lot of design work. Most scholars believe that Hermann von Holst didn't actually sort of intervene uh, in terms of the design of you know, what still was lacking, what still had to be done. But anything that needed to be done from a design vantage point uh, that you know, Wright didn't have drawings for, it was Marion then who was subcontracted from von Holst who was responsible. And in the case of the Amberg House, it was Marion who eventually decided, okay, I will do all of it. Um, so this is why I think there's something kind of sad about describing this as like almost a right house or it's kind of a halfway right house. It is really not in any way a Frank Lloyd Wright house. It is really a Marion Mayoni house and it just sings. It is one of the most successful prairie style houses I've ever been in. Uh, it's an incredibly joyful, exuberant house. Uh, I think the May House certainly can, you know, has its moments of, you know, just being uh, serene, magical, uh, transformative. But if you ask me where I want to have Thanksgiving dinner, it's not at the May House, it's at the Amberg House. Uh, there really is just something uh, wonderfully jubilant about this house. Okay, uh, it also turns, many of you will know this, but the two houses are very close to each other. It's really, it's like uh, on the other side of the street about a block away. Uh, from the two verandas, so this is the veranda for the Amberg House, um, in the winter when all the leaves uh, have dropped, you can see the May House veranda. So, right, the in-laws are that close, or, or Sophie's uh, parents are that close um, to Meyer and Sophie. All right, it turns out that Marion Mahoney um, is doing all kinds of really interesting design work. Uh, oh, sorry, in terms of the Roby House, let me say something very quickly about this. Um, so how much design work was still outstanding? Um, 
there are at least 25 drawings for design elements that post-date September 1909. So most of the Roby House was designed, but there were plenty of things that, that weren't, that had not yet been designed. And we know that because there's a different address. The drawings are still getting stamped, Frank Lloyd Wright, but there's a different address in the Steinway building. So Steinway Hall becomes where von Holst and Marion are continuing the design elements. Uh, and I forget what the address is, but it's a different suite than what Frank Lloyd Wright had occupied previously. So anytime you see those drawings, you know effectively that those must be Marion's drawings. And we have about 25 of those. Um, so clearly design work is still happening, even though those drawings are getting stamped uh, with Frank Lloyd Wright's, you know, sort of imprimatur. Um, what's Frank Lloyd Wright doing in uh, Europe? Um, well, you know, clearly he's trying to sort things out uh, personally. Um, professionally, he's using this opportunity to convince European architects that he's important. So, you know, how do you do that? Uh, you've got to publish your work. And so he publishes this incredibly expensive lithographic project that includes about a hundred of his projects. Uh, it does include the design for the Roby House, um, so a kind of whole array of, of different kinds of, of projects. And for many people in Europe, this is their first introduction to Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, as it turns out, uh, a fair number of the drawings uh, that get turned into the lithographs in uh, the Vasmut portfolio likely originated from Marion Mayoni. Attributions still are incredibly complicated, uh, so I'm, I'm not saying definitively that this is Marion Mayoni, but, the, but she has this incredibly delicate, kind of very sensitive way of rendering uh, particularly, particularly foliage um, and the way in which these, you know, sort of lines just kind of very gently suggest a natural context for these buildings. Marion was very good at that. So good that uh, she came to influence how Wright would draw buildings. So this is one of the things that makes attribution very complicated. So, you know, is, is, is it that this is entirely by Wright and he just sort of has absorbed this style from Marion? But at the very least, Marion deserves, I think, a fair amount of credit for suggesting to Wright how, you know, these kind of very geometric buildings could be cast as very natural sorts of forms. Um, this is a, a drawing, presentation drawing, for Mr. Roby by George Niedekin. Um, so George Niedekin is not actually part of Frank Lloyd Wright's firm, uh, but Niedekin is doing a lot of the design work in terms of interiors. Um, that's true of the Roby House. It also is true of the May House, uh, that lovely mural of the hollyhocks uh, in the dining room foyer area area of the May House is by Niedekin. So as you're imagining, like, how does that house actually, like, on installation day, who shows up with the furniture? Who's actually on site making sure, like, everything works? Uh, certainly you have to imagine that Niedekin was, was part of that team as well. All right. Um, any, anybody interested in, in just sort of knowing more about this? This is the, the really useful book. And in fact, uh, Olofsson in, uh, reproduces the contract. Uh, so there absolutely is a legal contract between Wright and von Holst. He lists the houses um, that were still outstanding, uh, and you know Wright sort of has quick notes about how far along the house is, what still has to be done. It turns out that the contract is as much about you know sort of turning over, making sure that clients actually get what they were promised, a finished house. Uh, as much as being about that, Wright clearly knows in September 1909 that he's going to come back. And so he's very sensitive to, will these houses be finished in a way that sort of is fair to his, you know, reputation? Is, or, or, or is everything going to fall apart here? The contract also spells out very carefully what amounts of money 
right is going to get because it's von Holst who's eventually going to collect. You know, the house is finished, all the, you know, sort of uh, 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 tick list has been satisfied. The homeowners pay von Holst, and von Holst has to pay Wright. So it's as if Wright is sort of turning over the practice. He's sort of like setting up a kind of caretaker uh, to manage all of this stuff so that once he's back, uh, he can, you know, get, get his money and sort of resume life as, as it was. Okay, uh, we know of at least two occasions uh, in which Frank Lloyd Wright was in Grand Rapids, and it may have been a dozen, but as far as I know, uh, only two are documented. Um, so one of these uh, comes in 1949. So Frank Lloyd Wright is uh, in town to give a lecture at the Ladies Literary Club, uh, a building that he probably, you know, at least would have recognized stylistically because it, you know, kind of this Richardsonian uh, Gothic revival from the 1880s. Wright must have walked into that building and felt, you know, like, I get this, I, I know what this is about. Uh, by 1949, of course, Wright is, you know, sort of especially cantankerous, and it's, you know, he's been cantankerous uh, for decades, but certainly by 1949, uh, he's honed that art pretty carefully. Um, so I've, I've listed some of, of how the uh, lecture was covered uh, by the Grand Rapids Press. It's pretty terrific. I'll, I'll read a little bit more. The title of the article is really terrific from the Grand Rapids Press, uh, Depths of Decadence. Um, right, so you know, you're not quite sure what, what those depths of decadence are, are about. Anyway, here we go. Uh, this is quoting Frank Lloyd Wright. The United States is the only great nation in history to go from barbarism directly into decadence without any civilization whatsoever in between. Frank Lloyd Wright, Dean of Organic Architecture, Tuesday evening, told a capacity audience at Ladies Literary Club. The lecture was sponsored by the Friends of American Art. He, he continues, quote, every people have their own character, shortcomings, and virtues. Our virtues are two, sanitation and ability with gadgets, Wright asserted. If America were destroyed tomorrow by atom bombs, what would be left that is characteristic of America? Only our plumbing, which future generations might put on their mantles as treasured relics of a past age. And it sort of continues like that. Um, I'm really intrigued, actually, by his you know, sort of reference to plumbing, because actually that sounds a lot like uh, uh, Duchamp's uh, criticism around his uh, famous fountain. If, those of you who know that story, if you don't, I, I'll try to explain another time. Uh, but the fact that Wright, in certain ways, is echoing Marcel Duchamp is sort of really crazy. Um, in any event, in 1949, and I'm sorry, I don't have a photo, I don't have a, a slide to show you, but there is a very um, impressive photograph of Frank Lloyd Wright at the May House. And by that point, the May House has been um, added on to, changed in a variety of ways. And we don't know what Frank Lloyd Wright is saying, but he's there with his third wife, Ogilvana, and he's got his stick out, and he's pointing, and he does not exactly look happy. So the assumption is that Wright shows up in 1949, revisits that earlier house, and is explaining to whoever is around uh, the ways in which it's you know, kind of been mucked about and is no longer what it was supposed to have been. Now, it is a really kind of interesting question of, had Wright seen that house earlier? And, and again, we just don't know. We don't know if he visited the construction site uh, when the house was in process. We have no record of it. Uh, we don't really know how even negotiations went between, presumably, Meyer May and Frank Lloyd Wright. Is it that Meyer May was in Chicago for business trips, and so you know he was meeting, you know, he was meeting Wright at Steinway Hall, or going out to Oak Park? We don't have record of how those interactions happened. But we have no record of Wright being at the construction site. And it's very hard for me to imagine that Wright saw the building finished because, if you're thinking through the, the timing of this, the May House is, uh, negotiations begin in 1908, the designs are worked out in 1909, uh, construction begins, but the house is not finished until 1910. Right, so once again, it is Marion, 
it is von Holst, uh, it is George Niedeken, they're the ones responsible for actually seeing that the maze can move into this house. By September of 1909, uh, Wright is finished. So uh, it's, I, I can't imagine a world in which Wright returns, and he doesn't return until pretty late in 1910, so in like what planet would Wright sort of come to Grand Rapids in 1911 to see how the house wrapped up? Maybe he did, but again, we have no record of it. That said, we do know that Wright was in Grand Rapids in 1935. So I want to read um, how we know this. Uh, these are the recollections of one of the other Taliesin apprentices. Uh, it's the recollection of Ben Masselink. And it turns out that Ben Masselink wasn't necessarily hugely important, but his brother was. His brother was Eugene Masselink, and he stayed at Taliesin for a very long time and effectively became Frank Lloyd Wright's like secretary or personal assistant. Uh, Masselink, you may recognize that, sort of feels like a kind of good West Michigan sort of Calvin name. Uh, I would very much love, I know that Gene Masselink and Ben Masselink did not come to Calvin. It would not at all surprise me if they had cousins, however, who were at Calvin. So at, at some point I'm going to ask a student to do some sort of genealogical project uh, through the alumni office and find the Calvin connection to the Masselinks. Uh, but in any, event, in any event, this story is pretty extraordinary. Okay, so uh, the event that is being described here is from 19... Well, I don't... I, sh I shouldn't say that. The car that's being described is, 19, is a 1935 car. I am assuming it's, a it's happening in 1935, maybe 1936. Okay, and again, this is not Gene. This is Ben, uh, who also goes on to become a, a Taliesin fellow. Now looking back, I realized that the first time I was actually aware of what my brother had done was the Cherokee Red 1935 Cord convertible sedan, top down, rumbling along the streets of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and turning into our driveway. I recognized my brother behind the wheel, but not the older man in the pancake Stetson and fluttering scarf. He could have been the Baron von Richthofen, or the Wizard of Oz, or at least the winner of the Indy 500. I ran to get my friends. By the time we got back, Gene and his passenger had disappeared inside the house. We gathered at a respectful distance around the car, all eyes, not speaking, and then fled at the first noise inside the house. Around the corner and out of earshot, we began shouting, wow, that hood. Ever see anything longer? That chrome, those bumpers, that's real leather on those seats, that dashboard, it'll go 120. Ah, uh, the glamour of it all. For me, at 15, it was the car. The man in flowing cape who got out of it dazzled and frightened me, as I think he did my dad and mother, too. But my mother loved the glamour. She loved to insert the teaser in any conversation with her friends. Jean says that Frank Lloyd Wright says, and the mouths would properly drop open. Gene had driven Mr. Wright in that open core down the rolling green hills of Wisconsin and along the sweeping outer drive of Chicago and through the smoky war of Gary, Indiana, and up along the huge blue lake through Benton Harbor and Saugatuck, Gene's old art school, and on into Grand Rapids to see the dentist, who was my dad. Mr. Wright wanted every tooth in his mouth pulled which would compare to storming the Great Wall of China single-handedly and in one sitting, and then to be fitted for false teeth. This greatly impressed my dad, as this was never done. It was too hard on the patient. Usually one or two teeth were pulled at a time, four at the most, but Mr. Wright insisted, and so my dad pulled them as if he were plucking corn off a cob. Mr. Wright never flinched, but treated it all as casually as if he'd come to have a hair trim. While all this was going on, Gene took me for a ride in the cord. Grinning at me, he must have driven past Central High School a hundred times, just what I wanted, and at first I just sat there stony, like I didn't know where I was, with the kids hollering at me, and then I jumped up and yelled and hollered back at them. Gene drove past June's house, a girl I hadn't dared to speak to yet, and all around town with me now in the back seat, waving like Lindy, just flown the Atlantic. 
That was the beginning of Frank Lloyd Wright and the fellowship for me. Not the Imperial Hotel or Falling Water, but that red 1935 cord top down driving the streets of my hometown. It, it's an amazing story, and I feel like it's an amazing story for a lot of different reasons. Uh, obviously, you know, it, it was transformative for this 15-year-old kid. It also is really extraordinary that Frank Lloyd Wright had all of his teeth pulled in Grand Rapids. Uh, you might be wondering why. Uh, bear in mind, right, that this is still the 1930s. There's very little work coming Frank Lloyd Wright's way. I suspect he did not pay for that, uh, you know, sort of dental procedure. Um, so if you have to drive to Grand Rapids for uh, dental care, uh, then so be it. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that Frank Lloyd Wright did not visit the May House um, at that point in time. So maybe 1949 is the first time he's standing there. Uh, I suspect he had, had, had visited in the mid-1930s. Uh, he only would have been about a mile away. Oh, if you're wondering, I, I, my brilliant students tried to find out where uh, Massalink's dentist office would have been uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and they did come up with an address, but it's, the building's no longer there. I think it's where uh, the, the police uh, department is downtown, uh, right? So that's about where, uh, you know, this kind of uh, incredible scene with the dentist would have taken place. That's only a mile from the May House. Again, it's just extraordinary to me to imagine that, that Wright wouldn't have visited. Okay, um, I realize that, you know, lots of extraordinary kinds of connections uh, in terms of Marion Mayone and uh, Dwight Perkins and the connections then between uh, Von Holst and the Roby House and the May House, uh, but kind of where's Fife in all of this? Okay, so let me here in the last few minutes return to Fife. Uh, so this is a drawing now in, or a rendering now uh, in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago from 1912. Um, and you'll note, it's kind of prairie style, first of all, uh, sort of bungalow crossed with prairie style maybe, uh, but you'll note the architects von Holst and Fife. This is not Bill Fife, this is his father, James Fife. And so James Fife goes to work for von Holst sometime around 1911, uh, maybe as early as late 1910, uh, maybe more into early months, middle of 1911. So, and I would love to be able to nail this down more precisely because it seems like every month kind of matters a lot. Uh, James Five was not partners with Von Holst when Frank Lloyd Wright signs over the practice to Von Holst in September of 1909. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright returns um, from Europe, returns to Chicago, um, I forget the exact month, October of 1910. Very quickly, he sues von Holst uh, because he's convinced that von Holst is not giving him the amount of money uh, that he's due. Uh, and so that, there's a kind of legal rambling, ra wrangling that goes back and forth between von Holst and Wright for, I don't know, three months, six months. Uh, in the end, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright does win. If you're wondering how much he won, it was about $44, as I recall. Uh, so, you know, $44 was more than it is now, but actually $44 was not that much money, uh, even in 1910. The May House cost $34,500, probably, with all, all things in. That's the property, design fees, construction cost, and interior work. So, you know, an entry-level house at the time cost about $5,000. Um, you know, clearly uh, there was no huge pot of money uh, that von Holst was, you know, sort of hiding from Frank Lloyd Wright. All of which begs the question, so what do we do with the fact that Bill Fife's father uh, was practicing architecture with the man that Fife signs over his practice to? And I don't have a great answer on this. Um, and it, it, I think it's particularly kind of fraught because everything else I know about the relationship is that James Fife, 
Or I'm reading a lot into it, but what I'm reading into it is that James Fife and Frank Lloyd Wright actually got along quite well. So is this von Holst very strategically thinking, it's not going to go well for me if everybody thinks of me as the enemy of Frank Lloyd Wright. And so if I can bring James Fife into the practice, then maybe that's gonna kind of smooth things out. I don't know exactly what the logic was. But the other kind of interesting piece of this, uh, James Fife joins von Holst around 1910 1910 is when Bill Fife is born. So, like, from the, like, literally, Bill Fife is born into a world in which Frank Lloyd Wright looms at every, you know, sort of corner in some sort of dramatic way. And I, I can say more about that next week. Um, sorry, I should have given you this image earlier. This is uh, what James Fife looked like. Um, he also attended MIT. So again, the world of Marion Maoni, the world of von Holst would have made perfect sense uh, to James Fife. Uh, it's an educational model that actually was not Frank Lloyd Wright's educational model um, at all. Um, I, think, I think he and Marion are, are maybe two years apart. I think he and von Holst were one year apart. So in some ways, this is a kind of logical sort of connection. Lots of other kind of interesting parallels. He and Frank Lloyd Wright are almost the same age. Uh, he also, James Fife, also designs a hotel in Tokyo. Uh, and also his hotel does not fall down, uh, right? I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright goes on and on about how he's a brilliant architect because uh, the Tokyo Imperial Hotel withstood the, the earthquake. Uh, the, James Fife could, could say the same thing. Um, they live just basically a stone's throw from um, uh, Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright and Kitty. Um, so they, they go to the, the same church together. They, they're all Unitarians at Unity Temple. Uh, it's a very, very close world, to be sure. I will say more about these biographical connections next week. Let me just give you a tease, because I think this one still relates to Mary and Mahoney a bit. Uh, one of the other ways, in, it's not only that Bill Fife had lots of, kind of close relationships growing up in Oak Park. It's not just this professional relate connection through his father, James Fife. He also has numerous uh, connections on his mother's side of the family. Uh, his uncle, so this would be his mother's brother, uh, his uncle, uh, Cudworth Bai, and, and bear in mind also that, right, that's what he's called at Taliesin. At Taliesin, he's not Bill Fife, he's Bai Fife. He's known by his middle name. Uh, he's, his middle name is his mother's maiden name. A and it was Frank Lloyd Wright who decided to call him that. So, you know, over and over again, Frank Lloyd Wright sees Bill Fife and sees all of these other connections. And Frank Lloyd Wright had to understand this connection because it was Bill Fife's uncle, Cudworth By, who commissioned this project, uh, the, Yahar, um, the boathouse on the Yahara River, it was not constructed, I almost said it was never constructed, it actually weirdly was constructed in the uh, 21st century, um, s somewhere near Buffalo, uh, not in Wisconsin, Wh which is really weird because it means that Frank Lloyd Wright had buildings constructed in three different centuries, and there can't be too many architects who, who can say that. Um, in any event, why did Frank Lloyd Wright care about this project? It was relatively small and it was never actually built in his lifetime, so what's the big deal? Frank Lloyd Wright would use this, and this is why he wanted it in the Vosmut portfolio. He would point to this project as proof that he had developed flat-roofed, international-style modern architect, architecture before the Germans, before the Bauhaus did it. So he's before Gropius, he's before Mies van der Rohe. He also lied about the date of this project. He would push it back to make it even earlier than it was. And so, the, and, and I don't just mean, like, it's not just that he wants it in the Vosmu portfolio. He would include this in subsequent exhibitions in the 1930s as the proof that he had beat the Germans to modern architecture. Uh, I, I think there's no way that Frank Lloyd Wright does not understand that Cudworth by is Bill Fife's uncle.
So, an extraordinary connection. What's the Marian connection? I think this is another one of those drawings that suggests a kind of influence from Marian Mayoni. And again, maybe she didn't draw it, but I think there's something of Marian sort of very airy, light, uh, sort of flowing quality to the image. All right, I've given you a lot today, and it, we should have some Q&A. I feel like that's a good stopping place. All right, I'm happy, I'm happy to take questions. You've all been very, very patient. Please. Great question. So a house uh, near Central, what are the streets, maybe? That may have a connection to Frank Lloyd Wright, and I do not know the answer. I will try to poke around this week and see what I can do. Please. We have been watching Murdoch in the street and in some of the later seasons. He buys a Frank Lloyd Wright house somewhere. Uh, <laughs> what do you know about that? I know nothing about it, but you've piqued my interest. So clearly I've got some watching to catch up on. So, sorry, Murdoch Mysteries, uh, there's this sort of plot where a house is, a Frank Lloyd Wright house is purchased, and what do I know about that? And I'm sorry, I don't know anything about that. I am absolutely always intrigued, though, by the, you know, the sort of, I mean, Wright ends up designing a lot of houses, right? And so, if, if your goal in life is to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright house, it could happen. Um, and I, I think the, the sort of danger of that is that actually it does happen, and now what are you going to do with this house? Uh, because without the kind of financial, uh, you know, sort of coffers of steel case, uh, quickly you're going to spend a lot of money on this. Uh, but I am, I, I love I, I love the long shots. I love the underdogs. I love the thing that's crumbling that we can't just stand by and watch it, you know, sort of cave in, so I, I'm intrigued by those stories for sure. Yes? There's another house that looks like Frank Lloyd Wright on Jefferson, south of Burton Street. Jefferson, house, Jefferson south of Burton Street. Just yeah, um, I, I think part of these Part of this absolutely speaks to um, the legacy of Wright. I, 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 someone will be able to correct me if this is wrong, uh, but I think Michigan has more house is the th is number three for the most Frank Lloyd Wright houses. Uh, so there uh, there's a lot of Wright properties here. Um, and a lot of influence, and now very quickly you're into the kind of bigger story of mid-century modernism, and you know the way in which the prairie style came to impact uh, what would happen uh, in the the decade or so immediately after World War II. Um, but it's older. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I don't know. Sorry. Oh, to, well, actually, the other thing I would add to that though is. Part of the myth-making of Frank Lloyd Wright is that Wright often left people with the impression that somehow he invented the prairie style and or that he was the only practitioner of the prairie style. Uh, clearly, it was a thing. Um, and, you know, so once again, Wright did not invent the casement window. He, there are a lot of things Wright didn't invent, but he just sort of managed to be very good at uh, deploying it very successfully. Uh, there is a whole kind of way of thinking about what was Prairie style separate from or alongside Frank Lloyd Wright. And part of that story actually becomes a story about Von, von Holst uh, and Marion Mayoni and, and other practitioners, many of whom had some presence in Steinway Hall. So, you know, as, as scholars have tried to begin to grapple with what did collaboration, what did partnership look like, uh, people must have seen each other's drafting tables, people are aware of these, you know, kinds of connections. Uh, it is not an individual story, as it were. 
That's a roundabout, not great answer. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you. Nick. Yeah, so if I could repeat the question, uh, Nick is describing visiting the Meyer May House and being struck by the decorative quality of the surrounding houses, walking into the Meyer May House and being struck by a really rich decorative quality. A absolutely, I think that is spot on. Part of this is, is just the differences, uh, is the issue of are we struck at any given moment by similarities or differences? Right, and absolutely you can find differences, absolutely you can find similarities. But I think it is easy to overstate the, the kind of language of, I don't know, um, purity or austerity or stripping, a, stripping things down to essentials or something like that. Uh, in many ways Wright is doing that, but he is still very much creating very warm interior domestic spaces and oftentimes he's using decorative elements to achieve those effects. I just don't see any way that's not true. Um, I guess I'm trying to imagine if Wright were here, how would he, what would he say about that? Uh, and, and, you know, he, I think he would want some sort of connection between the decorative effects and something like purpose or function. I think maybe he would sort of frame it that way. There's something to that at some point, though, maybe that's sort of hair splitting. I, I don't know. Um, it is, it's a really, it's a really great observation, though. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I don't have a great answer for this. I know a little bit. I, so you re sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Um, the question is, uh, the, is it, the son is named Lloyd, is that right? Yeah, so Wright has a, a handful, a bunch of children. Uh, at least one of them becomes an architect and maybe actually multiple people become architects. Anyway, there's at least one. Uh, and so the question is, what do we do with sort of Wright's legacy? What, what does the you know, sort of corpus of his son's architectural work look like? If we open that, sort of expand that up more generally, what, what does the corpus look like more broadly? Um, I think there is a way in which the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation is really kind of taking a more expansive view of what their mission is. I think there, there was a period of time where the foundation really kind of existed to build up the kind of story of Wright as a single genius. Increasingly, the foundation is interested in what is the legacy, what was the impact of Wright. So there is a kind of slow shift to thinking about interconnections. There's been a recent good book on Steinway Hall and trying to build a network, a web of architects rather than just thinking about Wright as better than everyone else, but how would we locate him in a network of other practitioners? So the moves that I'm trying to suggest are not unique to me. There are other people trying to think about Wright as a collaborator. But it seems like all of that still is pretty, pretty nascent. It, it still feels pretty tentative and, and, and young. I, I can give you a few things to look at, but it, I'm, I'm not sure. It's happening. But I think part of it also is just the sheer scale of it. As soon as you're interested in Taliesin Fellows, 
you're now literally interested in hundreds of practicing architects, I guess thousands, but certainly hundreds who, who really came to have successful careers. I've not talked about um, Alden Dow, but there's correspondence between Fife and Alden Dow, right? They both end up in Michigan. They're both you know, are doing work in Michigan. Uh, they're writing back and forth to each other. They're at Taliesin at the same time period. They overlap by about a year. So, you know, as soon as you start trying to build these webs and networks of practitioners, it turns out to be really pretty substantial. All right, I'm having Im immense fun. I will see you all next week. Thank you very much uh, for your patience. <laughs>